Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Forum. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Maya Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming on this beautiful day. It's eight o'clock in the morning on Thursday in Tokyo. Uh, today, we've got Dominic Carter and Debbie Howard from uh, uh, Carter Japan Market Resource Network. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the luxury market in Japan. Well, how the luxury market here has developed uh, during the past 15 years. The reason we decided to have this session today is uh, a white paper which was produced by uh, Carter GMRN in 2007. And, um, well, you might think that it is an old uh, white paper, but what is outstanding about it is uh, that uh, the trends which were captured back then, 14 years ago, actually developed uh, here in Japan and they influenced, they shaped the market. And uh, we are going to talk about these friends with, also, with some insights about uh, what is happening at the moment uh, during the pandemic and uh, some of uh, the expectations of uh, how the market will develop further. Debbie? Okay, thank you so much, Maya. I'm Debbie Howard, and I see there are several friends in the audience, uh, both new and from way back in the day when I first came to Tokyo. So uh, I am chairman of Carter JMRN, the Carter Group. That's the Carter Group Japan Market Resource Network. And um, I came to Tokyo in 1985. And I've, I must tell you, I know there's a few audience because I, I know who you are, who were here, there in Tokyo in 1985. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, actually. I moved to Japan from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and I was a self-proclaimed yuppie at the time. That would have been the, the uh, term. So, uh, you know, among Americans, we would have been the people who were buying branded cars and various things and kind of living the high life, uh, if, you, if you just want to put it that way. But Japan was even more more like that. Um, we, I remember in America, we were not buying the brands that uh, Japanese consumers were, were buying. And... Um, in Japan, when I got there in 85, it was the so-called bubble days. The champagne was free-flowing and luxury brands were something that you could see pretty much everywhere. Uh, I was working for McCann Erickson Hakuhodo and I found myself doing research for Amex and Citibank and popular brands at the time, such as Dunhill. Uh, some of you might remember that brand from way back then. Uh, and at, at the time, Japanese females were said to purchase the entire outfit that was displayed in the window from the top to all the way through to the shoes and the handbags. And some said that there was a lack of confidence in how to mix and match and that that was, that was why when it came to Western clothing, Japanese women would buy um, basically the whole outfit in the window. And, um, you know, basically what, what we saw uh, from the early 1980s is that foreign luxury brands began to transform the retail landscape and uh, their success was absolutely fueled by the prosperity of the affluent bubble years uh, of the late 1980s and uh, there was a kind of a luxaholic splurge if you will uh, with with Japanese consumers responding to their newfound prosperity. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more of the story um, in, in a moment but uh, by 2007, uh, Japanese consumers were recognized in the world to be the most highly valued customer in terms of world's, the world's luxury brands. And they drove over 40% of worldwide revenue in the global luxury branded goods market. And um, that's an amazing statistic in and of itself. Um, those numbers have changed quite a bit uh, in the years that have passed, but um, that's what we were looking at uh, by 2007. Uh, and I'd like to just backtrack just a little bit to uh, when I first got there in 85, because even then we could see the beginnings of a new outlook on fashion. So with all of those things happening, uh, women buying uh, from the window and that sort of thing, 
uh, and a lot of spending on luxury brands, we could see some glimmers of, let's say, fast fashion or competitors to um, luxury brands. And the example I have from the late 80s is Swatch, the Swiss watch that came into the market and started rivaling uh, luxury brand watches like Rolex and Omega. Um, and was quite successful in the Japanese market, even though it was basically um, a, a cheap, cheap compared to those those higher luxury brand watches uh, alternative. But we saw the idea of uh, fashion coming into the mix there. And, you know, that was probably an anomaly at the time in the late 80s, since we really didn't see that story of fast fashion unfold for luxury brands. Uh, and in the overall trends until the bubble burst. Uh, and, and Japan went through some 13 years of economic stagnation. And I'm gonna just stop for a moment there because um, the story doesn't stop there, but uh, I, I know Maya, you have some questions for me and, and I know that everyone here knows that Japan went through 13 years of economic stagnation. So we started with the bubble, everyone's buying luxury brands, and then suddenly all that came to a screeching halt in the early 90s. Yes, that's fascinating how Japan uh, well, actually... So one of the things that um, we've always noticed uh, in Japan is how women, the role of women impacts many product categories in Japan. And of course, that's true for luxury brands as well. Um, from the early 90s through to the early 2000s, we saw more working women. We saw more women choosing to remain unmarried for longer. We saw... Uh, many women choosing to live at home and use their salaries for mostly their own spontaneous luxury expenditures. You might have even heard the term back then called parasite singles. Uh, we always loved that term. We thought it was so colorful. Um, anyway, this group was responsible for much of the luxury brand wind in those 10 years of what was otherwise an economically difficult time for most of Japan. And the luxury brands really didn't do so poorly during that time. Um, overall because of these young women with their high disposable incomes. And we saw brands changing during this time from uh, being something that one had to buy to fit in um, to, to something that was a little bit different. And we're gonna get into that in a minute. But uh, to this point of brands and a, as a way of fitting in, uh, I'm sure many people in the audience have heard the statistic of about half of all females in Japan owning a Louis Vuitton bag, handbag. We couldn't believe that being from America because that wouldn't be something that we were aspirational for. But uh, in Japan, that for sure in the late 80s and, and even up to the, I'd say late 90s, was it was like a badge of achievement or accomplishment for, for many women. And um, and some of the luxury watch purchases followed that trend as well. But the Louis Vuitton handbag thing is, is probably the best example we have of that. And what we saw during the economic stagnation is that uh, publishers even started targeting uh, older working women. Before, let's say, the advent of the mid-90s and the Parasite Singles, uh, we had a lot of magazines, fashion magazines, beauty, travel, and global type topics targeting young women from the mid to late 20s. But what we saw during this time is that the uh, magazines widened their targets to include the under underserved segment of affluent women in their 30s, 40s, and even older with uh, magazines such as Nikita and Nikkei, EW, Grace, and Marisol um, coming uh, into the world in response to the purchasing power of this influential group. Uh, 2001 and I remember that uh, uh, what surprised me one of the things that surprised me here was uh, seeing women uh, getting on uh, well the subway trains and as you said you know they they carried uh, Louis Vuitton bags and at the same time they were dressed quite casually so what which was interesting to me so you alluded to that trend of um, the blending of um, well branded goods and fast fashion so um, how did that trend emerge is one of uh, the questions which I always have in my, in my mind. 
So yes. I wonder whether you could uh, help me a little bit with this. I think what we all have to remember is that, that that was a huge shock to Japan. During that 13 years of economic stagnation, surely that's a, that's a very long time. But we saw the end of lifetime employment. We saw uh, the growth of the Arbeiter culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and these were graduates who came out of school, let's say 92 to really all the way to 2000 or later and couldn't find jobs in Japanese companies in the normal traditional way. So we saw many, many uh, young people displaced in a way from the traditional Japanese system. And that would have been men and women. And we saw the rise of 100 yen shops. We, we saw things that we, we hadn't seen in Japan before. And, and one of the things that we saw, Maya, was that mixing and matching, the high and low. Um, part of that was forced because, you know, maybe, maybe people couldn't afford to have the whole outfit. But I, I like to think that the prolonged economic stress and the changes that it brought was, you know, kind of forced by people having to become more individualistic and to look inside more and to become more self-confident in the ways they chose uh, and had to choose to live their lives. Uh, we, we started hearing in focus groups early on in the 2000s that, um, you know, that the importance that consumers placed on brand name was decreasing. And we also saw that there was a rise of fast fashion brands like H&M and then you even had homegrown brands like Uniqlo. Uh, the, these were things that you you probably saw, and uh, you know it, it was quite unusual actually in Japan for those of us who had been there in the mid '80s. And and so what what we can see by again by the year 2007, we could see this more diversity in brand lifestyle. So we could see less dependence on luxury brands to prove one's own worth or value. We could see uh, easier acceptance um, that less exp expensive brands could actually deliver value mm -hmm. uh, in terms of quality and functionality because that was not the case in the mid 80s. People would just look askance at, at something if it didn't have a proper uh, country of origin or a proper brand name. Um, and we saw people gain more confidence in their own ability to create a fashionable look instead of buying the whole window look. So we saw a lot more mixing and matching, some of it not very good, if, I'm, if I might say, Maya. Um, but, but I think it's all part of that evolution of consumer um, desire for unique products increasing and the importance placed on brand names decreasing. And that created opportunities for new entries at both the high end in the luxury category uh, so super high, mm -hmm. and, and and then also for safe, affordable fashion choices at lower price points. Right. I also remember that in the white paper wrote about uh, the changing um, perceptions of the customers, and you just alluded about this here that people, um, well, they were becoming more individualistic. So, what uh, exactly was that trend? It was more about um, me first than me too. So that's yes. something really big that uh, shaped uh, the market at that point and years later too. Yes, yes, I think so. And and uh, we, we could also see that there was a bit of polarization mm -hmm. between, let's say, a luxury loyalist, someone who would never ever mix, a brand, mix brands, maybe not even the luxury brands, um, to what we would call independent fashionistas. We saw, for example, a lot, of, um, a lot of the brands in other countries like France and, New and, and the US and New York and Paris, for example, they were actually sending scouts to Tokyo to look at the independent fashion choices on the streets because that was, that was helping them to, to lead the world in a way. Uh, so we had, we had this really interesting thing happen um, Louis Vuitton was kind of like a democratization of luxury, if you will. But then, of course, it led the way for there to be even higher brands and, and lower brands and this polarization. And I, I, think, um, I think that is all a, a really good thing um, because I think that Japanese people deserve to have uh, that kind of confidence and that kind of fun when it comes to fashion. 
Uh, we, we also saw fashion brands, however, having to work harder to, I shouldn't say fashion brands, I should say luxury brands, having to work harder to uh, create experiences for their consumers so that so that they could keep those consumers paying those prices. So we saw a lot of the flagship brand stores in Tokyo, for example, adding experience components like yoga studios and cafes or restaurants. I know everyone in this group has seen this and showrooms with extra bells and whistles um, more than the usual. And, uh, and I think that uh, with the luxury loyalist, let's say uh, a, a brand fan, if you will, they became even more choosy and discerning than before. And they demanded more from the brands in terms of experience in return for paying those prices. Uh, and that, that created challenges for luxury brands to deepen the emotional bonds between them and the brand. And we definitely saw that in the marketplace. Um, I think we also saw on the lower end of things uh, with low cost manufacturing, we, we still saw among Japanese consumers this demand for authenticity. So uh, continued mistrust, for example, of China as a source of origin. Again, I'm talking 2007. Um, and, and demand for uh, quality to be delivered, even, even at a lower price. So I think Japanese consumers have taught the world uh, much about quality and, and what, what we should all be demanding from products no matter, no matter what the price is. There was another little trend that in 2007 that perhaps wasn't so little, but we called it the emerald effect or green luxury. And that would be the, let's say the early beginnings of the demand of consumers for the companies they purchase from to be sustainable and eco-friendly in their production methods. So we definitely saw that coming out uh, early on in 2007 as well. So those would be the five, the five big trends that we saw. So the, the, the diversity in brand lifestyle, this shift from me too, let me be part of the group and show I'm part of the group to me first, I'm an individual. Number three, sort of mind, body, and soul, uh, having more of an experience with your brand. Um, number four, um, maybe I'll accept a non-known label but I still, I still need quality from it. I still need, I, I still need something to be delivered well for me. And uh, this, this uh, green luxury, the emerald effect. So those, those were what we were seeing um, right around 2007 when, when again, Japanese consumers were the world's largest consumer of luxury branded goods. That's fascinating because only recently, during the past uh, several years, uh, did uh, Western brands uh, start talking about experiences and enhancing their experiences uh, for the customers. And uh, and uh, so it's really interesting to see how Japan is actually the leader. That's, uh, well, let's say the think tank, if I can say, yep. and leader of uh, creativity in this field. I think so. I think so. And, and it, it even extended as far, Maya, to... Uh, travel destinations. Mm -hmm. So, for example, many Japanese uh, tourists would go on these shopping uh, expeditions where they would spend uh, hundreds of thousands of yen on, on the branded goods in the foreign country. So let's say go to Italy and buy Gucci, for example. And there, there are lots of stories from back then of long lines outside and um, you know, again, this is, this is, you know, this shifted quite a bit after 2007 and we, we saw the Chinese consumers come up in terms of their luxury brand consumption. But, but back then in 2007, uh, that is exactly what was happening. Right. Yes. Um, there have been quite a few such, <laughs> such, um, let's say destinations uh, for luxury shopping. And yes, I can uh, attest to that because yeah, my field of business at the moment is the travel industry. But oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yes. You would know. <laughs> yes, indeed. And um, Dom, Dominic, I have a question to you now. So um, let's see, David told us what happened in 1980s until 2007. And so um, could you please uh, let us know, uh, well, if we fast forward from that time in 2007, uh, what has happened since then? 
So there are 15 years. This window is also quite significant for um, the luxury industry here in Japan. Yeah, well, I think um, China happened. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I think, you know, there, there are several elephants in the room in the luxury market mm -hmm. at the moment. So I think sort of those trends that Debbie was talking about kind of continued. Um, and it's not as if prosperity at scale returned to Japan after 2007. So we never saw anything like what the environment was when Debbie started off in, in Japan. So, I mean, though, those, uh, those trends of fast fashion and, you know, collaborations with fast fashion and so forth, um, extended, but, um, we also saw, um, in that time that, uh, a lot of physical retail in Japan, especially in the. Uh, in the places like Ginza and so forth was supported by Chinese tourists increasingly. So um, I think that uh, Corona, the Corona crisis has actually kind of exposed several elephants in the room um, in the area of luxury. Um, but of course, now with, uh, with China having its own, going through its own kind of transformations, if you like, uh, the brands really have to focus again on Japan and uh, as being, you know, really the core, um, the core market potentially, um, again, for fashion. Um, but, you know, as, as you might imagine, Japan's a bit behind in some areas, uh, especially digitally. And it, it's, it's very interesting to, if you look at that mix of um, online and physical, Japan is still very much weighted in favour of physical. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's an interesting statistic. Twenty five percent of LVMH's physical retail space is in Japan, in in Asia Pacific, and this includes India. So this is across the entire region. Um, physical is kind of over um, overrepresented in Japan, um, and I, I don't think it, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that I think to some extent the brands let the let the grass grow under their feet digitally um in in the last few years in japan so they're kind of they're kind of scrambling to get on top of digital uh and of course they've been forced to, they've really been forced to do that uh because of the crisis so when the crisis hit i think i think a lot of these businesses realized that they weren't really quite ready to be working on a on a digital only model um or a very heavily digital model and i think this is this is a little bit different than let's say in china for example, mm -hmm. um, so that whole like, that whole sort of um, in that sort of interface between digital and physical is something that the brands really need to um, get on top of. Um, the other the other thing that is extremely important for them to be on top of at the moment is actually their their sort of position um, in in the consumer's life as a whole. So. So in terms of cultural relevance, I think luxury really from now um, is kind of in a fight for that, um, you could say. And the, you, you are seeing some interesting examples where the brands are sort of mixing, uh, mixing and matching the contexts in terms of where they pop up in, in life. And th there's a degree of creativity around that. Um, Reese, I don't know if anyone's seen this. Um, I posted it on LinkedIn this morning, um, but there's a tie-up at the moment between Microsoft Xbox and Gucci. Yeah. So there's a, a million yen um, <laughs> leather uh, game controller case and branded game controller. So yeah, I mean, like that. That obviously culturally, if you look at young, if you look at young people, look at your Gen Zs and so forth. You know, these people, video games are extremely important to them. So like in, in this case, Gucci is reaching reaching across that um so in term in terms of the brands their sort of value story is going to need to be continuously refreshed so just the i, I think people are, are looking for for stuff that that's new and interesting and and unexpected uh because i think the worst thing that you can do with the consumer at the moment is to bore them um, so, you know, another, ex another kind of cool example of how this is being done at the moment, if you go to Miyashita Park in, uh, Shibuya at the Balenciaga store, um, someone's got, uh, spray painted Gucci on the window, right. um, because Balenciaga and Gucci are doing collaboration. 
uh, so I think it's the uh, it's the Balenciaga bags, but they've got the Gucci patterns on them. So unexpected, unexpected. So these, these collaborations are seems to be the go to way at the moment that the brands are actually keeping themselves fresh and interesting. So we've, we've seen like a few of these, well, not more than a few actually, but as I say, Gucci, uh, Gucci, Microsoft, Balenciaga and Gucci, they're spray painting each other. Um, we had about, I think it was about 18 months ago, Reebok pump Fury and Maison Margiela. So Reebok pump is like, I mean, your average price for pump Fury is about 20,000 yen. Maison Margiela, of course, is about 100, 100, 150 up, something like that. So you've got these, um, they're basically Maison Margiela pump furies that are like $1,500, 150,000 yen, kind of interesting. Uh, but, you know, Balenciaga and Crocs even. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the sort of the mixing and matching is getting sort of, you know, kind of, kind of unexpected, you know, Crocs. You, you sort of, you may think that they have kind of a, a, a sort of a Dasai image but but like you know anyway Balenciaga's playing on that so there's and there's been all of this play on you know sort of dad shoes and whatever in the last five years and you know so I think um collaborations are important um if they're just being done for shock value though it sort of remains to be seen how you know successful longer term that's actually going to be. And then you do, you do start to, in my humble opinion, you do, you do start to mess with the, the values of the brand and why people buy them um, in the first place. Yes, that's uh, fascinating because it looks like when you, well, you mentioned Balenciaga and uh, Crocs, it looks like a marketing, um, um, well, trick just to, uh, well, uh, let's say a, a trial to address the younger generations here. So it could be, but at the same time, it looks like, uh, as you said, the luxury brands, they need to reevaluate their stories and make them relevant. So the question is um, how, how they address the different generations. And well, I, I think one important point is that the irony only works if you really understand what the brand is in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> um, if, 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 if that, you know, like, so I, I I, I, like it's interesting, but I don't think it's the answer right. <laughs> for how okay. these brands need to um, need need to need to move forward. I think you know cross generationally. Um, well, it, it's it, you you really address it, like in, in in luxury in general now mm -hmm. you're addressing many different types of buyers. Um, of course, the brands cannot ignore the fact that Japan is the largest aging market. And I haven't seen really anything that kind of, I can see that's really addressing that yet, but the, the wealthiest segment of the market is the senior segment in Japan. Um, and you know how, I think there are, put it this way. I think there are, there are opportunities there, but the, as in, as in many markets in Japan, yes, you do have to have a, you do have to seg have to have a segmentation thinking about it, but. Um, the reality in luxury is that really where you need to head to is a one-to-one, -one, uh, a one-to-one -one level of marketing. Mm -hmm. So people expect that. And the, what the brands need to do is they need to, they need to manage the relationship that they have with, with their customer. Um, it has to be a much more, um, uh, detailed and engaged interaction that than they've probably had in the past. Um, there are many touch points now um, that where people are coming into contact with the brand. And if you're a savvy, let's say if you're a savvy brand fan, you're not just going to go to the shop. You're not just going to go to the uh, to the brand's website. You're, you you may be you may be shopping on you know secondhand websites. You you know if there's a particular um, piece that you're very interested in, or you're interested in the history of the brand as well. Right um you, you know department stores of course have a big stake in uh in uh continuing to sell luxury and and in and it, in some ways you you could imagine that uh if anybody would understand where the brand fits into um you know other other things that the that the that the consumers buying it would be department stores mm -hmm. so as, as if department stores you know, can really nail their digital channels, then of course the, the brands that, that that's something the brands can take advantage of, of course, 
um, but it's something that they need to be it's something that they need to be aware of. So it's kind of like I, I, I look at it as almost like a crazy quilt touch point <laughs> network that you've got with consumers. Like they're experiencing the brand in lots and lots of different ways. So yes, they may they may if they're a real fan, they may be interested in the shoe five years ago that they couldn't buy at the time five years ago that's now popped up in uh, you know on a on a secondhand site. Um, on top of that, you've got, you know, you've got people like uh, Zozo Town and, and so forth, where they're building up very detailed digital profiles of, of the, of, of, of the buyer, right? So, you know, this is, this is, in, this is going to be very, very important as well. So it's kind of like, how is that, it, how, how are the brands able to kind of, uh, maximize the information that they have on the on the consumer to be able to attain that what that one-to-one -one goal indeed and that's a new ocean which a lot of the brands are just learning how to swim in well they're behind in japan and they and they realized they were they, it hit them like corona hit them and they realized we don't have actually a business that's designed for this Right. Um, so they're, they're, they're having to, um, they're having to really, uh, think about all of that stuff. And I think, I think the business of luxury, while there are, I think there, there still remain very strong opportunities in, in Japan. I think it's one that is becoming more difficult. Um, and it, it's one that, you know, really you need a very, you need a very sophisticated, whole comprehensive approach, um, to it. Yes, indeed. I just wonder because it well, it means that they'll have to rethink the uh, the space. Well, it's not only the store space, but it's the of course the, the digital space they uh, uh, they operate in. But also, I wonder going back to physical the physical world. So you mentioned mm. the segmentation and how important it is, and that uh, there are a lot of opportunities with the aging market here. But I still wonder, as uh, the new generations come in as well, and they uh, they gain purch purchasing power, are we going to see the role of women uh, to continue to be as significant as it was, let's say, in the first decade of this century? Uh, so I think there, like, there are sort of two elements. I think you're mentioning physical retail. Yes. Um, and sort of younger people coming up through that. So the way that younger people relate to physical uh, retail is pretty uh, interesting and pretty important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, it's not either they shop physical or they shop digital. I, I, I think we, we can imagine that. Like I, we sort of see how that works, but, but they really need to work sort of seamlessly. So, you know, yes, like omni-channel is a bit of a cliche, but it actually is completely what these brands really need to be doing. So how am I, how am I sending people to retail from online? How am I sending them online from retail? When they go to retail, what's the experience like for them? So they're, you know, it's all very, it's all very well for brands to be uh, working on their aspirational content, right? But like that aspirational element can have a distancing kind of effect with people. So, so physical retail can actually be quite intimidating, especially for people who are like living in digital world. And so that people, and, and, and people are, you know, they're intimidated around that space. So how the staff are in the physical space is extremely important. So their, their ability to make you feel welcome, to show warmth, to actually help people through um, and, you know, build that connection, which can then be continued online or literally online, L-I-N-E, right? Like they, they, you get to know their sales associate, right? Who then contacts you over social media, um, channel, um, chat, chat channel. Um, in terms of women, um, I think women are going to be, you know, always have been the drivers of, of, of luxury, um, in Japan, even though men, men can be big buyers as well, but of course, um, the mega trend would suggest that uh, women's disposable incomes are going to only increase in the future as their um, value in the value in the labor market goes up. So, yes, I think um, I think that that needs to be addressed. But also culturally, 
in the context of of gender i mean it, it, it's you know, the i the idea that stuff is just men's or women's too i mean you've got to like you've got to put that thinking out out of your mind a little bit um some of the stuff that you see now i think kind of works kind of across genders mm -hmm. so it, it it's sort of yeah and and of course the, the these are influences from overseas as well where uh you know culturally people are playing with gender and the brand the brands kind of probably are at the forefront of that they need to be right because they always need to be challenging um at the forefront of culture so i think that you know that happens as well but clearly from a practical point of view yes women are women are, are gaining more put will gain more purchasing power that's for sure um it's a long-term trend that women are going to be be you know, essentially more powerful in japan japanese society so i think the brands have got to they've got to you know play that out and you know possibly just a personal opinion but of course i think you know maybe there's a more serious aspects to it as well that they may want to they might want, they may want to play with um you know selling to a more serious woman possibly but but with again building some fun into it as well because you know that that kind of approachability um aspect for brands i think is going to be very important as well so right yeah i hope that makes sense but <laughs> yes it does <laughs> yes um, look welcome yeah well, good, good morning um uh, you know, it's a really interesting topic. I, I, I work for a small boutique uh, uh, importer of um, uh, wines and spirits from, from New York. And, and um, uh, I, I get a lot of social feed, of course, from uh, stories from New York and, 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 and really great uh, insight on, on, on Gucci and, and its sort of collaboration with, with Microsoft and, and, and other brands. And I think um, <laughs> it's, we haven't reached fever pitch just as yet. And... Um, uh, one thing that came to my mind when sort of mentioning about how the, the brands are trying to, you know, that sort of cross generation or how, how to reintroduce their, their brand to, to uh, uh, younger people is, is the, the Ridley Scott movie that's going to come out very soon with uh, Lady Gaga, um, you know, um, she speaks for herself, um, you know, Selma Halek, uh, you know, Adam Driver. Uh, I think I've seen this, the shorts of the movie. I haven't seen it myself, but I just think that's another example of a, of a, a luxury brand trying to um, educate the younger uh, generation about, well, uh, you know, what, what it is and, and what makes it trendy, I want for a better word. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I think from what I've seen, it, 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 should, it should be an, an, an awesome movie. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was just another example of, of, of the brands trying to um, reinvent, especially Gucci, trying to reinvent or educate the, the market in, in a different way. Yeah, it, it, that embedding in culture. I mean, how the brand, like, so even if you sort out, even if you sort out that omni, even if you sort out your channel issues um, and your, uh, you know, your uh, CRM system and all that and, and all of that, all of that stuff, the brands still have to make an impact in culture. And you like how, like it's a, it's a typical marketing problem, but like, how do you present the brand to the world so that people sort of do have an idea of what the brand actually is, but then there are ways to uh, execute and interact, which can appeal to many different segments. So something like that movie, I totally agree, Luke, is like a really important uh, type of thing that these brands um, need to be doing. Yeah, and usually with Japan, we're always the last to, to receive, uh, you know, um, you know, movie releases. So it'll be interesting to see if they have, you know, the, the tour of all the actors, if, if the Japan can open up, and and um, you know, what what sort of impact will have on the, the the Japanese market. They'll be yet to yet to see. But well, again, it, yeah, yeah, it's that mixing and matching. It's right. So Gaga fans, like, we, you know, and there and there are a lot of. I, mean, I don't. I don't think Gaga's like, you know as big in japan of course as she is in other in other markets but you do have these diehard gaga fans here who probably don't buy i mean they wouldn't make the connection between gaga and gucci or they sort of do between gaga and fashion and you know so like you sort of you're always it's this it's this t twist of what the brands need to do it's almost like this twist of the kaleidoscope that they need to do every time because 
that was last week and now this is this week and here's a new twist and yeah you know, unless they're unless they're really dynamically alive like that they they're they're going to lose relevance but they've got to sort of hold on to that thing that that is their essence so they can't they can't lose that sense of who they are hmm. Hmm. no i can understand what hmm. you're saying there you know thanks very much for the, hmm. the comments thank you thank you look yuka hello Hi everyone, uh, Timothy, you look really cute today. I like that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Dominique and Debbie. It, yeah, like Luke said, it's, it is a really interesting topic. And I might have missed some of your point, Dominic, because uh, to, this is the very first time I've heard the brand name Balenciaga. Mm. I have to ask Maya through back channel, and I thought because you're talking about Valencia, you know, like a city in mm. Spain, <laughs> and then I have to Google the brand, and oh my God, they're, they're totally beyond my pay grade, um, <laughs> because I'm in world of like a Uniqlo. But anyway, um, so yeah, it's probably great the brand the mixing and the matching, but uh, still expensive brands are expensive, right? And so, like, yeah, you know, the Debbie said there's a parasite single, and then I haven't heard the term for a while, but anyway, yeah, so maybe the young girl may have discretionary income, but, you know, like Japan, like you guys are saying, and, you know, lost three decades, and average salary is like a 450, no, I'm sorry, 400, no, 45,000, and income hasn't changed for the last 10, 20 years. So, well, it's one thing the brand can be created, but there, there are certain segment of customers who are willing to pay for those, right? Mm. So, and then, so I'm trying to find, you know, like, a, because uh, the Balenciaga, I, um, there, it is a private company, so they don't disclose, you know, like a sales breakdown. Sometimes company disclose how much of their sales are from Japan. I couldn't tell, but uh, so, are there like a such a consumer segment as parasite single and they're willing and then capable of paying those brand names goods? Thank you. See, I might have missed you because I, you know what you said because I was so busy finding a brand. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the 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 those issues are very real. Japan is not as Japan is not as wealthy as it was. I mean, on on a different project. Um, I just made a casual comparison between average household income in Brisbane, Australia, and Osaka, and 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 the 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 income in Brisbane, which is a secondary Australian city, or Osaka is a secondary Japanese city. It's almost twice as much. So the the um, you know Japan is not as prosperous as it was. Um, I think the view that there is a singular kind of parasite single segment, or that there is a single segment on anything. Um, I think is sort of probably a little bit outdated um, marketing thinking in a way. Um, and I think the brands are challenged because there, there was a lot of business that was coming from the business transacted in Japan that was coming from international buyers as well. So I think a lot of this kind of creative stuff that you're seeing from the brands, I think is a response to the, to the growth challenges that they have and we, we should expect them to be creative. Um, but, you know, this, and this, look, this is just, a, again, this is just a personal opinion, but the, you know, they cannot ignore the age structure in the population in Japan and the fact that it is older people that have, um, that really have the money to be able to spend on discretionary stuff. Uh, so, you know, there may be, but, but we sort of have to, we, we, we've sort of got to change our thinking around you know what older people are like and what they want to buy and that sort of thing and the largest segment in the population is in their mid-40s um in 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 japan the largest buying you know um so you know it could be um you know having having that as a view of, of who of who potentially is the buyer rather than you know singles but of course when you form households in japan your budget for for luxury you know virtually disappears um traditionally so yes, it is challenging, which is why it's a crazy quilt. And people, and they've got it. These brands have got to look for who their buyers are from a lot of different um, sources, and it's a lot harder work than it was. 
so what you were saying, maybe I missed a part that maybe there those you know luxury brands are sort of shifting their focus to like a more of a wealthy senior segment. Is, is that? Well, they have to look everywhere. I think mm. it would be a mistake to it would be a mistake to consciously move the brand older because that that's not really. Um, you know, that, that the brand will lose its dynamism if that, it, but, but the potential buyer might be older. So that in, in some cases, so, so they sort of have to, they've really got to cover a lot of different, different bases in the way that they execute the brand. I mean, you're not going to find like, it's unlike, well, I don't know. I don't know who is the buyer for the $10,000 game controller. I, I I don't know who the buyer for that is. It may be it may be it may be someone with very rich parents. I don't know, or it could be, you know, a successful entrepreneur, or it could it actually could be a fifty year old who likes games, right? Because people who are fifty used to play video games. Like it's not what a fifty year old was twenty twenty thirty years ago. So who's the buyer for that? I think that that's sort of a, like you sort of got to have your imagination kind of working <laughs> the cogs of your mind into who who on earth would buy that is kind of like yep that's what you the luxury what? buyer yeah. is. Let me Google that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> We've got also um, Ravi. Good morning. Hi, morning, morning, everyone. Morning, Dominic. Morning, Debbie. Morning, Maya. Timothy. Morning. Uh, I mean, uh, great, great, great insights. And I think, I mean, this this subject is kind of very close to me because I used to kind of like okay, service SK two at one point of time in, in my career. So I mean, uh, it gave me a good uh, understanding about this category as well as the consumers in Japan. Uh, now, I mean, we know that I mean, in in a couple of in ra- last few years, I mean, we have seen there have been a drive of live streaming shopping. And I think COVID actually triggered that and mainly driven by China, right? And and, uh, and and where they actually kind of like, okay, I mean, the key opinion leaders or so-called the live shopping where they actually tied up with the luxury brands and, and they started actually reaching out to, to their so-called targeted consumers. But sadly in Japan, it never picked up, I mean, except for one client, I mean, one manufacturer, or I should have one brand, I should say, Shiseido, because for Shiseido, the uh, outside of Japan, China is the biggest market for when it comes to the skincare and luxury products. Uh, so I think they did a good uh, step to keep it in, in, in line with what was changing. They kind of partnered with the key opinion leaders and, and did the, I mean, they came up with the so-called their own app where they had created their own e-commerce live platform where uh, they were able to engage with the, the so-called Chinese consumer and they still maintain their, uh, their online sales. But I mean, on the other hand, I feel like Japan in, in particular has been actually very slow in adopting the new methods to reach out to its own uh, so-called consumers. And yes, I mean, as, as you guys have mentioned earlier, like, okay, it's, it's because of the, I mean, the silver generation, uh, low adoption to the, to the, to the, uh, how should I say the online, um, platforms. But I mean, uh, I believe like, okay, you, I mean, the, as we have been saying, like, okay, millennials and even the Gen Z's, they are changing. I mean, they are, they have their own uh, consumption habit and it's very different from the silver generation, but I believe like, okay, they are the next one who are the so-called target consumers. Shouldn't, what should these brands be doing to target them? I mean, and I think in the online platform is the one way to go. And the other could be the line app, which is the most popular, uh, I mean, app for chats in Japan, right? I mean, yeah, right. I mean, I, Ravi, I think, yeah, no, this is a really, really good point. So I, I, I think in, in Japan, I don't think I, I, I know it's interesting to sort of consider why that, why what's working in China hasn't really taken off in Japan. Um, I mean, you could say, well, Japan doesn't really follow China traditionally. So, I mean, that's, that's probably part of it. If any, it, it, it's, it started off being the other way around, but of course, China has gone on its own uh trajectory there but i i think in the in the brand relationship that you have with buyers here i don't think it's a journey um like it's not a journey to a single purchase and i don't think the journeys are fast i think they're probably lit, like there's a lot more um 
deliberation. I think there are a lot more layers in the way that people come to the point where they where they want to buy in Japan. So maybe that sort of live streaming shopping is just a little bit too aggressive. Um, you possibly in China you sort of have this where people just like want to buy. They just want to buy it, right? So like, give it to me the fastest way that I can possibly obtain it. Uh, which is not really how I think people are looking to, to, to buy in Japan. So I think, you know, a journey may start online, you know, people looking at blogs, they're, they're looking at the company's site, they may go and visit the store to actually see what the product looks like. Um, and then they may buy it online. Um, and so, you know, I think the brands have a real, have a real challenge in terms of keeping, um, keeping the buyer where they, where they want them. But I think those sort of like um, sort of stuff you're seeing in China, which is kind of sort of it seems kind of mad cap from sort of where we where we look at it, um, doesn't necessarily fit in with with the pace of the con- of the consumer here. Maybe in the integrity and layers that they need in that process. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, in that way, yes, that's true. I mean, uh, but I believe, uh, I, I still believe that, okay, I mean, if, like, for example, like Zozo Town, right, on the, one of the famous online retailers, mm. I mean, they are selling premium goods, but un- they are unable to actually tap into the luxury brands into their platform. And I think if they, if they are able to do it, or even like, okay, Rakuten or uh, Yahoo, for that matter, if they are able to tap into the engagement with these luxury brands, I'm, I'm very sure, uh, like, okay, consumer would start seeing it in a different way. I mean, I totally agree, like, okay, see, I mean, the brand with, the luxury brand, with, they offer that experience physically, like, okay, the kind of service, the attention you get it, and then you are able to get uh, much closer to the product. Uh, and I think that's where I come from, okay, because I would like to have that touch and feel before even actually thinking of buying it. But... Mm. But I mean, uh, uh, like, okay, but I mean, I know, like, okay, I recently, the Tomorrowland, which is the another so-called, I will not say a, a luxury brand, but I mean, it's kind of on the same, uh, somewhat on the similar platform, which offers uh, different kinds of clothing. So, I mean, they have started their own app, I mean, or page online. And, and, and I think they kind of, like, okay, come up with all these kind of different, um, uh, like, events or even the launches. Mm-hmm. Of the product and which helps me to engage with the brand itself. Well, they they know they need to do it, and yes. and there are like there are pop ups on Sozo Time with with luxury brands, and I I think they and and luxury brands are getting into line, and and I think they can use line as an approach to get to know their customer better, in terms of like uh, you know even surveying them and so on their preferences and so forth. So I think it's impossible for the brands to ignore that these other channels are there and are actually, and the successful ones are going to have to work with them. So they, they, they cannot, they cannot be these kind of like sort of just, you know, like icons that sort of, you know, don't, don't engage with the way that people actually buy and the way that people actually interact and that kind of thing. But, but, you know, I think there's a, there's a degree of experimentation going on now. Yeah, yeah, and they need to manage their risk around that as well in terms of what the image of the brand is. But I mean, look, the way people—it's changed, right? This is the way that life is today. <laughs> it's not yeah. being dictated by the brands. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, th- thanks, Dominic. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Ravi. Well, Mark, good morning. Mark, are you there? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Maya. Thanks for organizing today and Dominic and, and Debbie, your comments, <clears throat> really, really interesting, fantastic insights. Um, a, cu- a couple of comments and then a question. Um, you know, I worked at Hitachi in the rail division a couple of years ago and, and we were designing trains for the, the JR companies around for, for luxury experience train trips. Um, we didn't make any money on them, but, but the train operators, you know, they're sold out for two, three years in advance, these trains. Um, and I just think that, you know, when you look at the aging demographic in Japan, you know, that's the, that's the target audience for those luxury train trips. And I'm just wondering that that might be a, a co-creation opportunity for like a, a house of Gucci or a, a Balenciaga to kit out the interior design of the trains, partnering with the Hitachi as the makers or with JR um, as the operator. And then maybe then extending that brand down, you know, by, you know, looking at the, the, the bullet trains that run between Tokyo and Osaka every day, the green cars, you know, what's, what's to stop a Balenciaga or a Gucci from, from partnering and, and kitting that out. 
Um, and again, the global duty free has always been a huge uh, driver of luxury brands. Um, you know, it's happy hour when you get through security check. It's all luxury brands and, and global duty free. Um, so I just think that's an area to explore. I would think, particularly in the Japan aging demographic that you talked about. Um, the other the other comment is it seems like the the co creation of extending the luxury brands down into you know more pedestrian streetwear. You know, like whether it's a Nike or an Adidas or, or whatever that you know normally you'd sell for fifty bucks, but if you can slap on a luxury brand onto it, it, it suddenly sells for five hundred dollars, um, and it costs about the same to make that fifty dollars sneaker as a five hundred dollars sneaker. So, so it's a great way for the luxury brands to be relevant with with less affluent consumers, but then it makes them feel more affluent, right, at a price point that they can turn. So, I think that's a really interesting comment you guys made. The the, the last thing I have is a question, Dominic, really for you guys is 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 the psychographic research like what motivates consumers in Japan to buy luxury goods? Like, what are the what's the self actualization? What is what is it that motivates? It feels like in the in the bubble years, Debbie was talking about it was sort of like the, the identity within a group that it was sort of the I want to be part of the group, so I'm buying it so that I can feel the safety of the group, and it's also showing that I can compete with that that group or be part of that group. What, what's the psychographic research saying now about Japan? Like, what's what's the what's the motivation of consumer purchase behavior in luxury? And thank you very much. Yeah, well, I, I think that, um, and Debbie, you may well like want to sort of add to this as well but the, i think debbie because he because debbie saw that change you know we saw that from the 80s where it was like well you had to have it in order to be almost like respectable i, I think luxury wasn't really an, an expression of dominance and power like which it might have been um in western countries i think luxury is almost like a ticket to minimum uh acceptance almost so so that that and I think that's and then and then luxury became something that was a way of expressing who you are. So the brand is actually used as a tool by the consumer to to express themselves. Essentially, it's a it's a it's a tool that you have at your disposal to show the world who you are. Whereas previously, it was it was just to show that you know I'm re I'm respectable, I'm okay, kind of thing. Um, which is very understandable in, 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 in Japanese culture. And I think that now, I think that's still the case, but I think that it's probably in flux again as well. And the, 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 the crisis that we've recently gone through, I think is probably um, changing again, what the role of luxury is going to be, especially if people spend a lot more time at home. Um, so it may not, it may not always be so much about how I express myself to others, but, but sort of how I, you know, create, um, feelings and experiences for myself. Um, and of course is much more experiential. So things like that, you know, decking out the trains with a certain brand or whatever, I think is exactly, um, you know, what's going to be, be needed, but yeah, there could, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the brand consumption may not necessarily be public consumption it's it's not just for not just for an audience if you like or for for social expression purposes yes i i agree dom and and you touched on a couple of really important things there and and one of them being the two years of this pandemic that we've gone through which is another dramatic change for all of us we've we've gone through that globally but of course the 13 years of economic stagnation in japan uh, from the bubble days until, let's say, 2007 was one huge change. But now we've had uh, a really dramatic thing happen in the last two years, and it's changed quite a lot of things like remote work and people maybe not going out as much. Um, we, we are seeing a changed consumer in many, many uh, categories, not just luxury. And, and so the luxury brands are going to have to, you know, redefine and understand the role of luxury and what are those aspirations. I think it, it doesn't always have to be about showing off. Um, it could be about telling yourself that you're worth it. And Japanese consumers have always been very, very, uh, appreciative of good quality. So I don't think that's going away, but I think, uh, the way that people look at things definitely, definitely has changed. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see. We may have a little bit of whiplash. We may have some, you know, like uh, moving back to to uh, rewarding oneself, perhaps after such a such a traumatic experience. It's it's kind of difficult to say, actually. Well, but, it's uh, everything. It'll be all of that. 
Yep. It'll be all of that. But I mean, the, 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 the need, like I think the, the, the uh, being, being sort of in these states of emergencies and working from home and all the rest of it, the, then the needs, the needs are different. Yep. So it, it's the psychographics may be relatively stable, although I think, you know, that, that sort of changes a bit under crisis but the needs are different if i'm at home all the time i don't need to wear i don't need to buy expensive clothes so <laughs> so what what am i going to, what am i going to spend or or am i going to have a gucci track suit at home because like that makes me feel like i'm you know elevated people still want to be elevated they still want to they, they still want to have that feeling but you know it, it's different different contexts different places mm -hmm. different occasions all of that kind of thing so Having the, having the crisis comes in sort of, you know, puts a hand grenade into the whole way that everything was um, mm. set up before. And I think that, yeah, the psychographics change, but actually the actual needs are different yeah. too, because people are spending their time differently. So yeah. it depends on how sort of sustained those, those changes are. But again, it just points to more and more fragmentation and more and more the need to find many, many different ways to yeah. help the consumer experience the brand. Mm -hmm. Tim, just a few words from you. Yes, uh, it's a great discussion. And I actually had a few things to say, but we had so many great people come on stage, I decided to kind of fade into the ether. Um, not that this is really uh, my topic, you know, but um, I want to thank Yuka for making me laugh every morning. You know, I'm, I'm wearing a Uniqlo t-shirt. And uh, as I told Yuka, when, when I splurge, I buy Muji, right? So that's about my extent of knowledge in, in the field. But I just... I, you know, Dominic, to your last point, I, in the last couple of days, uh, I watched, I, I saw some commercials on Japanese TV. And one was, um, it, I don't know if it was a commercial, but maybe it was a news report. But the, anyway, it's a company making pajama suits. So if you're doing a Zoom chat, it looks like you're wearing a suit, but it's as comfortable as pajamas. So I just... Uh, it's such a Japanese uh, interesting solution or, you know, or, or approach. And, and I think they're trying to brand it, you know, as a luxury item. Have you seen that, Dominic? I, I haven't, but I need that. <laughs> yeah, right. I, right. I, I hope they make it in my size. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. What a great idea. Yeah. And then and then the other thing was, and I, you know, I, I don't think you mentioned this, but um, they were talking about the luxury Japanese department stores. And then they had the, you know, the iconic shot where you walk into the Japanese department store in the morning and everybody's lined up and they're bowing, you know, they're the very, the whole formal Japanese thing, right? And then suddenly you switch to this virtual reality. It's an app you download on your phone and it gives you a walkthrough. I, I forget which store it was, but it gives you a walk through the store and you virtually walk up to a counter and you talk to a virtual person. And I thought that was fascinating. Again, from a, from a cultural perspective, we always kind of looked at Japanese culture as the term we used was radical empiricism, where you, the Japanese almost have to have the sensory experience to appreciate stuff. And with the digitalization of the world, I, you know, I think all of us are slowly backing away from those experiences, or maybe we're just being comfortable not always having them. And I never thought Japan would go there, but it seems like maybe they're also decoupling from the sensory world um more so than they had in the past at least that's my my humble uh take on it but anyway i'm going to leave it at about 9 15 so thank you everybody it's been a great discussion i hope we can do this again because i have lots of stuff i want to hear and talk about too so thank you very much thank you tim right okay and uh, so let's see jennifer You've got the question Hi, without me. Hello. Thank you for coming. Hi, yes. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I have a poor connection today. I'm sorry. Well, we can hear you well. Okay, great. So I actually have a question about credit card culture in Japan, uh, specifically versus the United States. So I live in New York City, and from my experience, the people who drive the fanciest cars and own the fanciest condos, they actually don't have a lot of money. They simply have a lot of credit. Um, and the people who actually have a lot of money tend to drive Toyotas and shop at Uniqlo and save money and pinch their pennies, uh, but they're the ones with the, the fattest savings account and brokerages. So I'm wondering, in Japan, what is credit card utilization like and 
what is credit card culture in general um, like over there? I think I've heard that Japanese people have an aversion to debt. So I think perhaps it's not quite as bad as the US, but I just wanted to get your ideas on that. Uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think that that's kind of right. People generally don't buy consumer items on credit in Japan and that people are very, very careful about their use of credit cards. And so the people's spending is usually very well thought through and it's very planned out. Um, it, it, it's not to say that people won't buy, like if it's a big purchase, they may, they may buy it on what they call bunkatsu, which is like, but, but you'll divide up the purchase maybe into three different payments or whatever, which is done through the, through the credit card company. Um, I, I think also just sort of like a, a generally lowered level of prosperity or a stagnant level of prosperity in Japan actually means people do need to access credit. Um, but I don't think, it, I don't, I wouldn't think that it's the same sort of conspicuous consumption culture driven by credit that you, that you may have in other markets in Japan. Um, what do you think, Debbie? Yeah, I would agree with that, Dom. I mean, I think I think generally speaking, revolvers, for example, Jennifer have always had trouble in Japan revolving credit, whereas that's a, you know that's something that we have a problem with in the United States. Uh, so I think Japanese consumers in general, again, it's a very broad generalization, are very careful with their expenditures. Um, I don't think we have. I think that you will find some of the contradictions that you mentioned, uh, but probably not as strong probably not I mean, as strong. The, the interesting part in japan in cards and, and is pay, payments in general like payments in japan is like you can't if you're not if you're not living here you couldn't even imagine how complicated payment systems are in japan yeah. it's, utter, it's utterly crazy yeah there you can't so even many... use a foreign card in well, some... well just the way that everything's set up though i mean you know you, you, with with the different payment systems yep. credit cards points you know pay 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 links to the credit card yes uh, it's or, all the or, collaboration you know, between them <laughs> it's, it, it's it's nuts the whole payments landscape is extremely complicated and some of it links through to credit mm. but you know a lot of it's very points driven as well so the the behave like rakuten points for example does drive a lot of um the decisions people make yahoo points pay pay points there's a lot of manipulation of purchasing that goes on um through points and and this actually does extend into into luxury purchases as well i mean why would you if i can get 10 times the normal level of rakuten points to purchase the item on a rakuten store well, what are you going to do <laughs> it, it, it's very very influential Indeed. So it's fascinating. And sorry, I just tried to say that there is also quite a, a lot of collaboration between those uh, um, card operators as well. And uh, yes, there is really a lot of um, complications here. It's good to hear because I know a lot of the uh, luxury consumers here, they have no intention of actually ever paying off their credit. Um, oh. It's just intangible. The number means nothing to them. Mm. So it's good to hear it's not the same in other places. Mm. Well, that's good indeed. And I also have an image, you know, I, well, I haven't seen this recently here in Japan, but uh, until several years ago, you know, it was a quite a common sight. You have a, a Lamborghini or a BMW, you know, parked in front of a, a, a hundred yen store. And then the drivers, you know, they, they would go into the hundred yen store and, uh, purchase several items, you know, and get out, get in their cars and drive away. No, I'm just wondering, I just have to ask, I'm sorry, Maya, am I the only one who didn't know this brand? <laughs> you, you may be. I may be. Oh my God. Is, is this brand that big? I realized that. Yes, it is. Boom, boom. Yes. Oh, seriously? Yes. Okay, I, I got to step out of like, a, you know, the TJ Maxx. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> We look and Yoka, thank you for coming up on stage with your questions. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us. And um, yeah, I, I can't say enough how fascinated I have been with Japanese consumers for all of these years, all of these many, many years, I would say. And, and this is no different, you know, things change and uh, clients, brands, categories, we all have to shift. We have to figure it out. 
when consumers change. And a lot of things are happening in the world now, but as we heard today, they've been happening for 30 something years. So it's just the next, the next step of, of adapting. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.